Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and I'm happy today to be talking to you about plant hormones. That's right, plant hormones. We're not the only organisms that produce hormones, that is animals. Plants also make these hormones. They're chemicals that are capable of moving from cell to cell, and they communicate a message. So it's sort of like a chemical text message. And it's produced by one cell, and it's received by another. It's usually a specific cell is, is uh, destined to receive it. And then that cell does something. That cell either divides, or it grows, or it stops growing, or it dies. Something like that. There's some sort of effect as a result of it. So let's jump into this conversation. I think you're going to like it. Um, one thing that I want to say about it is it's not so much important to recall you know, in terms of memorizing the names of hormones. It's great if you can recall them, but it's more of a, uh, the point is to enjoy them, to understand the bigger picture. And, and, uh, and so the word hormone itself comes from a Greek word meaning to excite or to set into motion. So it's kind of like if you think of a, a big chain of dominoes and you flick it with your, with your finger, that would be the hormone to get going, to, to set into motion. And so hormones are pretty common in most organisms, and they're produced usually in one part of the plant, and then they target another part, as I was saying before. One of the very first plant hormones that was ever isolated, and it's a, it's a pretty cool story, I'm going to actually mention it in this video, uh, has to do with the hormone auxin. And it's a, there's a, actually a couple of different kinds of auxins. It's, it's basically a growth hormone. And when you have auxin, you're capable of normal growth, and when you don't have it, you're sort of stunted, in other words, a dwarf. And so, you know, here you have tall plant, short plant kind of thing. And so um, the chemical structure for auxin is very similar. This is auxin. It's also abbreviated IAA. It's very similar to the amino acid, as you can see here, tryptophan. And so one of the things, I just wanted to show you what we're talking about in terms of chemical structure. Uh, some of the hormones could be steroid-like, and some of them could be uh, peptide-like, for example, auxin. And so just the big picture is that cells can communicate with other cells. Um, it can be locally. Cells can produce chemicals that are secreted from little vesicles, and they target adjacent cells. And this is something known as paracrine signaling. It's sort of local. And then in, a, in the nervous system, neurons don't actually come in contact with one another, but they can communicate. How do they do it? Well, in their uh, axon terminal right here, they secrete these chemicals called neurotransmitters, and there's a bunch of neurotransmitters. Uh, acetylcholine happens to be one of them. You should check out neuro neurotransmitters if you're interested in that. It's the way in which neurons communicate. In other words, it's sort of like... Uh, post office where you're whispering in one person's ear and then they're whispering the next. So in other words, the brain, for example, can communicate with the foot in order to kick a soccer ball by moving a neurotransmitter to cell to cell to cell to cell and then ultimately the neurotransmitter will connect to the to the muscle which through the neuromuscular junction, which is also a synapse, and then it'll cause the muscle cell to contract. So all that is sort of called paracrine. Now, a hormone, uh, for an animal at least, is produced by glands. Now, plants aren't, aren't known for having glands, but we have groups of cells that are specialized for secretory purposes. And so these endocrine glands secrete hormones, which are the, what these blue structures are. It, and it goes into the bloodstream, and it travels throughout the body, and it goes to a target cell, for example, an endocrine cell could be like, for example, in our brain, in our pituitary gland, and it produces a hormone that travels in the blood and goes all the way down to the ovary and tells the ovary to start developing a follicle. Or the, this hormone can come from the uh, adrenal gland, and it goes into the blood, and it, and it causes uh, the lung and heart to increase respiration and, and, and uh, heartbeat. And so... Animals don't have, I, plants do not have this blood <laughs> to, to go into. Um, they have instead uh, vascular tissue. And so hormones can travel through the vascular tissue in xylem sap and in phloem sap, but it can also be cell to cell as well. 
through simple diffusion. And um, it's, it's often long distance. We call that endocrine because it's on the inside as opposed to a, a gland that's an exocrine gland. Like, for example, your salivary gland produces saliva, which then travels in a duct to the outside, like which is your mouth, or, or the mammary gland to the outside. So hormones, chemical messages. So the, resor the research of how plants uh, bend toward the light led to the discovery of plant hormones. It's a really cool story. As you can see here, it's the sun, and plants are moving towards the light. And um, this is an example of what we call phototropism. Tropism means uh, toward something. It's an orientation toward, so it's toward the sun. So in order for that to occur, there has to be some bending, which occurs over on the dark side. So that's kind of interesting. If the dark side cell bends, in other words, the cells elongate, uh, then the whole plant will sort of orientate itself towards the light. And you can actually see the plant moving throughout the day as the sun moves across the sky. It's pretty cool. And so this is referred to as phototropism, positive phototropism moving toward the light. You can even see it in, in a forest. And now this is a real powerful event. You know, a forest is very competitive for light, so you got to be able to, to roll a little bit. And frankly, branching uh, increases a plant's ability to compete because it can have more leaves and it can also move around in order to get sunlight. And so what we know about phototropism and what we know about hormones, the experimental ev evidence came from this sort of simple corn um, when the very first thing that comes out of corn is that radical, which is the beginning root. But then this very first shoot that comes up, um, there's a sheath that surrounds the stem called the Chloe optal, if you recall that from a pre previous discussion. It doesn't have to be corn. It's like just grass in general. It's surrounded, monocot, it's su surrounded by this Chloe optal. And if there's, um, you know, if it's light is coming directly above the the shoot will grow straight up, and if the light's off to the side, it'll grow to the side. And so the reason that it's bending over here is that there's presumably sun over here shining, which means these cells right here are elongating, which is causing it to bend. Now, what's fascinating, this is a great picture. So here's corn. Look, at here's the root system coming off of the corn. This is some sand right here. As you can see, it's sort of like stages of development. This first little sheath that surrounds the stem is the Chloe optal right there. And then this in red is the very first leaf, true leaf, that's coming off of the corn. But here's the Chloe optal. That's what we're talking about. And you're like, well, why does the Chloe optal, uh, how does that even relate to phototropism? So let's take a look at this. So here's the Chloe optal. Again, if light is coming from the left, that means it's going to bend toward it which means the shaded side cells are going to elongate, which causes it to push over. So it's differential cell growth. What's causing these cells to elongate and to divide and, and move in that direction? Something must be weakening that sort of cellulose wall, allowing the cells to get a little bit larger. What's happening? Well, the same thing that's happening in the root. Um, for example, the root is showing positive geotropism, and the shoot is showing negative geotropism. So there's something that's causing, right over here, the shoot to bend, and then ultimately it's going to bend towards the light, and something's causing the root to bend over on this side, which pushes it in the down direction. So in other words, these cells are elongating right here, which is then pushing it down. And these are elongating, which is causing it to move in an upward direction. Well, would you be surprised if I told you that one of the very first scientists to work with phototropism was Charles Darwin himself? And interesting, it's, uh, it's Charles Darwin, Darwin and Darwin. What does this mean? It's Darwin and his son, Francis. They were both working on this towards the end of Darwin's life. It's pretty cool that he was, that he was teaching his son uh, the science. And so... What they were doing was growing um, some seeds, and you can see here's the Chloe optal, and they were noticing that this is basically the control. When there's light over here, it's going to bend towards the light. And then they noticed that 
if they <coughs> simply severed the tip of the chloeoptal, in other words, cut it off with a knife, suddenly the chloeoptal doesn't matter where the candle is placed. It doesn't bend. And so that might lead you to believe that perhaps the tip of the plant is important in some way. I, I, I'm not sure if I would know what, but I'm just saying it. obviously the tip is very important. Okay. So then they decided to keep the tip in place like the control and this time cover it up with like a piece of cloth or something opaque. They didn't, I don't think, believe that they had aluminum foil. But if you wrap this up in aluminum foil and not allow the light to touch the tip, it still would grow in a straight direction. And that's interesting. And then here, it's, it's not so much that you cover the tip. Here's something that's covering the tip, but it's sort of see-through. So clearly you might come to the conclusion that light was important. And then you're like, well, maybe light is important in general. Why just the tip? Well, if you cover the bottom part of the chloeoptal lower, again, that doesn't influence it. So it appears to be the tip. So Darwin and Darwin sort of showed that something about the tip ability to receive light is very important. But what's curious about that is I mentioned to you before that you're like, yeah, light, I can see how that's working. But ultimately what's happening is these are the cells that are, that are being affected down below. Do you follow that? If these are the cells that are being affected, the ones that are elongating, which is causing it to grow, what does the tip have to do with it? And how can the tip talk to the side so to the to the side of the chloeoptal. So another experiment was conducted uh, in which um, Boysen and Jensen, kind of a long time ago, 1913, they did what Darwin did. They cut the tip off and then they put it back on and they put a little piece of gelatin. So if you can imagine like an agarose gel. Now agarose gel is permeable. Substances can diffuse through it. So how do you like this? Even though the tip was severed, and you put a gelatin block in between, it still bends. Hmm. Well, over here, the cut is made, the tip is put back on, and then this time an impenetrable uh, barrier is put there, something called mica. In other words, nothing can penetrate it, like for mica, like a countertop. So this is interesting. So this is being exposed to the sun, and nothing's happening. And so this is weird. Both of these were cut off, although this allows things to go through and this doesn't. Any thoughts? <laughs> and so Charles Darwin, I, I put this picture here showing phototropism with a dust lamp, but in fact, he didn't probably have a dust lamp. Uh, he was probably using candle or the real sun. So he was able to uh, determine that the tip is needed for phototropism to take place. And then again, uh, Peter Boyce and Jensen uh, demonstrated that there might be a chemical substance and it might be mobile. And again, you know, where, where is that coming from? Uh, it might be a chemical substance because it needs to travel from the tip to the side for these cells to elongate. And it is capable of penetrating here, but it is not capable of penetrating there. And so this is cool. So then in 19... Uh, 26, went, <laughs> it's a cool name, extracted the chemical messenger. So the mysterious chemical message that was coming from the tip and proposed its name being oxen, meaning to sort of to grow. And so how did, how did this group go about doing that? Well, if you cut off the tip and after it's been exposed to light and basically you put that onto an auger block, the chemical, now known as oxen, would simply diffuse, like the pink chemical is oxen. Are you, are you grasping that? So this pink is this oxen, and so it diffuses into the auger, diffuses into the auger, and then look, here's the auger. So the auger now has the oxen in it. So how do you like this? So over here, when you cut the tip off, nothing. Over here, you put just auger block, nothing. This time, you put the auger block that's been soaking in the, in the oxen, and watch this, the, 
notice how this is dark and this is light. It's diffusing into the Chloe optal, and then ultimately it's diffusing down the side here. It's affecting these cells, uh, causing them to elongate and to grow. Or over on this side, depending on how you place that. And so if the auger, if the auxin goes on this side, it's going to bend to the left. If it goes down on this side, it's going to bend to the right. Wow. So it's a chemical, and it was isolated, and it, it looks like a little tiny tryptophan. It's auxin. That's pretty cool, huh? So that was a, one of the very first uh, plant hormones that was discovered, auxin. And so it's a classic. And so as you can see, this purple sort of shows that when the auxin travels down on this side, it's going to cause uh, this, the Chloe optal to bend, or phototropism, or geotropism, either one. So plant hormones, that was just the first plant hormone. Plant hormones, what, what, what do they do in general? And this is the come away message here. This is the take home message. They help to coordinate growth. They help to develop plants. In other words, to flower, not to flower, to germinate, to, for uh, fruits to ripen, to basically do all of these things that a plant needs to do in response to environmental stimuli, like what we were just talking about, the environmental stimuli was light. So why? Well, again, because plants are planted. They cannot make these adjustments of growth and development uh, by moving. In other words, when winter time is coming and, and, the, and the days are short and it's snowing and there's going to be no more water and, and you're in a, in a deciduous forest, why don't you just drop your leaves? And so, but, hor you know, what's going to cause that? Hormones are going to cause that to occur. Or it's now, it's spring, it's time to flower, for example, if you're a flower that blooms in the spring. But hormones are going to coordinate that. And so these are chemical messages to get things done in response to the environment. And so they, sell, they can control cell growth. They can even control cell death. Sometimes you want cell death to occur. For example, if you're uh, a primary meristem, say you're uh, procambian, and you're producing xylem cells uh, in the vascular steel of the root, and you want those cells to eventually die, well, a hormone's going to cause those cells to die. And so that's important. Or if you want the plant to grow laterally, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be cell division, the sort of push the meristem out, and that's going to be a hormone that causes those cells to divide. And so there's a bunch of plant hormones, let me assure you, but I'm just going to cover a couple of them uh, today that, that are fairly common in most plants. So that's why I'm, I'm choosing these. So auxin, some cytokinins, you might even be able to predict what that does, some gibberellins and some up cysic abscisic acid and ethylene gas. And so one thing about plant hormones is that you really just need a small amount. All you need is a little like knock knock on the door and the cell knows what to do. And so they're needed in relatively small amounts. And so uh, plants are needed in small amounts of, con of hormone and they it's not even so much like a lot of cool experiments were done in terms of like too little hormone, too much hormone, and, it, and basically one of the major factors is the ratio of the hormones to each other that really cause an effect. And so this is the, um, the IUPAC name for auxin. Auxin is sort of the common name. So this is uh, IAA, which is the hormone that is involved in phototropism and geotropism. And it's, as what we know, know it's produced in the top of the plant, in the, in the Chloe optal tip. And so there it is. That's a chemical structure of it. And so auxin affects uh, many different aspects of the plant development, but chiefly it stimulates elongation in the, in the stem and growth, as well as phototropism and geotropism. So it's, it's a growth kind of hormone. So what's interesting is developing seeds uh, can produce auxin as well. So that's a source of it. So, and it promotes the growth of the fruit around it. And since we discovered that, we're able to induce uh, tomato vines, for example, to develop seedless tomatoes because um, the synthesized auxin that we're spraying on, it substitutes 
for the normal synthesized oxy, uh, auxin by the developing seeds. I find that that's, that's pretty interesting. And then these cytokinins, um, they, as the name implies, they stimulate cytokinesis or cell division. So cells are growing. So if you want a cell to grow, it's going to take a cytokinin to do it. And so a little, this is a bit of a detail, but I, I find this kind of interesting. And so despite a lot of effort, the enzyme that produces cytokinins uh, has not been purified. And the gene for that hormone has not been identified as of yet. And so it might even be that plants themselves do not produce the hormone, but rather bacteria that live symbiotically with them produce it. Isn't that crazy? And so um, along those lines, many years ago when um, individuals in Asia were growing rice, they noticed that there was a something weird was happening to certain uh, crops of rice. Some of the rice were growing so quickly and so long, the stems were growing so long that they actually topple over uh, because of the weight, um, even before they were able to mature and flower. And so it was discovered that the reason they were growing so fast, sort of like foolish, foolish seedlings, um, is because there was a fungus that was infecting them. And as it turns out, that this hyper stem elongation uh, was caused by the hormone gibberellin, which causes uh, shoot elongation. So if, if you're familiar with like um, lettuce, which tends to be like a low growing, uh, meaning like close to the soil kind of thing, like a head of lettuce. I did an experiment once uh, back in college where I was adding different concentrations of durabellic acid, which is a, another way of saying durabellin. Durabellic acid and, and varying the concentration, I was, get, I was able to get the lettuce seedlings to really elongate. That's pretty cool. So it affects uh, stem elongation. So it's a growth kind of hormone like auxin. So that's kind of neat. Uh, we can also spray uh, gibberellins on grapes, which cause them to um, grow a little bit larger and um, be all puffy like this. And it's like not only are they desirable to be purchased this way, but it also enhances um, air circulation between them. And so it makes it, when, when it rains, or if you're uh, just simply watering your vine, water tends to, when the grapes are small, get inside and, be, and then it causes mold to grow. And so it's, it helps when the grapes are a little bit larger. And then um, an embryo of the seed is rich in gibberellins as well. And so after water comes into a seed, it in, imbibes seed after hydration, there's a big release of that hormone from the embryo. And what that does is it causes the seed to sort of break its, its dormancy and germinate. And so that hormone tells the seed it's time to break. And so this, as you can see here, the root is, is coming. Here's the root hairs. That's kind of neat. And then up cysic acid. I always think of uh, when I when I say that, probably mispronouncing pronouncing it. Up cysic acid. It reminds me of a pair of scissors, which is kind of a cutting thing. And cutting means like for cells to um, to sort of stop growing. So this is like there's a hormone like auxin and gibberellic acid and uh, cytokinins are all kind of growth. This is like not growth like when you're cutting something to stop growth. And so it's kind of antagonistic to growth hormone. So it stops growth. And so what's the effect of it? Why would you want to stop growth? Well, hold, seed dormancy. I mean, like remember we said that when the seed is, uh, the zygote is fertilized and it forms the embryo and then it suddenly the seed becomes dormant? Well, you want seed dormancy. And it's like, well, how do you know that there's, uh, this hormone inside of a seed. Well, the concentration of it is very high inside seeds. And so what's interesting is being dormant or not growing is a survival value because you do not want the seed to grow unless the environmental conditions are right. And so when the light is better or if it's warmer or if it's more moist, then you would want germination to take place. And so it's kind of a trade-off between, um, you know, gibberellin and uh, 
of cisic acid. And then here's a really cool hormone. I like this one a lot. It might be my favorite. Um, you've heard of the expression, it only takes one rotten apple to spoil the bunch. And the reason that is, that's kind of like, that must mean that one, ro one ripening fruit affects others. And how does it do that? Well, it produces a gas. This particular hormone is gaseous, which means that it's volatile. It can actually diffuse in air. And so fruit ripening, for example, if there's a a rotten apple in the bunch, it really will cause the other fruits to ripen at the same time. It triggers it. And so even on a tree, once one apple starts to, to ripen, all of them start to ripen. And, and again, that's really important. Ripening fruit is, is critical because it's very attractive to animals to come along and help for seed dispersal. And so it's a real, it's kind of a cool example of a positive feedback in hormones. Usually when a hormone is produced and the concentration gets too high, the organism stops producing the hormone. Does that make sense? It sort of regulates it. It's called negative feedback. This is positive feedback, which is kind of rare. In other words, the more ethylene, the more ethylene. And then there's then it ripens, and then even more ethylene, and then even more ethylene, until how does it ever stop when all the fruits are ripe? <laughs> and then they're either picked or they fall off. Another example of positive feedback is, is during labor. There's a hormone called oxytocin. Now, plants don't have labor. We're talking about female mammals now. Uh, there's a hormone called oxytocin that increases labor contractions in the uterus, and then that sends a signal to the brain, to the uh, posterior pituitary gland that makes even more, and then even more, and even more, and it's uh, it'll never stop. Well, then when the baby comes out, then it stops. And so fruit can be... Uh, ripens very quickly. Like, for example, if you buy some bananas and you want them to ripen quickly, you can put it in a bag. Or if you can put your bananas in a bag, or apples in a bag, or fruit in a bag in general. Now, this may seem trivial, but boy, sometimes, you know, if you're in agriculture and you're shipping in an, or flying in an airplane, like, a, a, several tons of bananas from Central America or South America to the United States, it is no game. You don't want those bananas. You don't want a ripe banana inside there, <laughs> inside the cargo hole of the plane. It could cause all of the bananas to become ripened too quickly. You lo lose a lot of money. And so we've learned that like flushing with carbon dioxide uh, prevents the ethylene from accumulating. And so there's certain uh, chambers on on ships, on trains, in in uh, trucks and in airplanes that uh, circulate to prevent ethylene gas from accumulating. How about that? <laughs> and then um, coming to an end here, where I, I want to talk a little bit about programmed cell death, something called apoptosis. And so, cells. Sometimes you want plant cells to just simply die. And so they're not programmed to die on a particular uh, schedule. They don't, you know, just shut down. So if you want a cell, a plant cell to die, what we think is happening is that there's ac an active expression of a gene which produces an enzyme in the in the cell that basically said it, it's sort of suicidal. The enzyme comes along and breaks down crucial things like chlorophyll, DNA, RNA, proteins, the membrane, and then the cell dies. So it takes an active role in death. <laughs> and it's like, well, why would you want that? Well, some examples of this is that you want your leaves to fall in, in autumn. So in other words, the petiole, the cells that are holding the petiole to the stem, those cells have to die. And then the petiole becomes weak, and then the wind kind of blows it off. Or, or it's a cue to the plant to die, an annual plant, after it's flowered if it's uh, in, the, in the first season. Or if you're xylem and, and, you, and you want your xylem cells right over here to die, then this is what happens. And so uh, a great example of uh, programmed cell death or apoptosis is the leaves falling in autumn. And so it's a great adaptation to have your leaves come off like this because basically if there's not a lot of sun, all you're doing is losing water, losing water, and um, it's a lot of work for 
uh, for no good. And so this is cool. This is showing that right at the petiole, this is where the petiole is connected to the stem, that right down the line, it's almost like perforated paper, all of these cells are programmed to die right there. And so it becomes very, 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 very thin. And it weakens, the, these enzymes that I'm talking about weaken the cell walls, and therefore it's just simply wind will come and knock it over. And so I hope you enjoyed that. I, I know plant hormones, sometimes people love them, some people don't like them, like them but I think it's just a matter of uh, getting to know them and appreciating some of the cool things that they do. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it was helpful. Thanks for watching.